Today we're going to look at the role of the supervisor within the work environment that will assist the employer in making sure that the work environment is safe. The value that you can add to your employer in limiting the potential for any criminal or civil litigation that may flow from the management of the working environment. So now it is a acceptable statistic that 98% of whatever goes wrong in life and more specifically at work is through us as humans. You would agree with me if I say that a person's behavior can be influenced by what that person really knows. Knowledge and understanding of the implications of the task become an important precursor for treatment. That when we are going to do the things at work that we've always done, we are going to get those same things that we've always got. A predictable outcome. As Einstein said, it is insane to think you do the same things over and over and over again and expect a different outcome. How mad can you be? And the worst thing that one can do in life at work is nothing. And in saying this, therefore, I want us to understand that when we are going to do the things that we've never done, which is outside of a comfort zone, we are going to get those things that we've never really had. Specifically you as supervisors. Because remembering that you are now the conduit between your employer and the employees. And to that end, we need to now refer back to this beautiful piece of legislation, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, with clear objectives. One, is there to provide for the health and safety of persons at work and for the health and safety of persons in connection with the use of plant and machinery. And then it also speaks about the protection of persons other than persons at work. Against what? Against hazards to health and safety arising out of or in connection with the activities of persons at work. Then for the establishment of an advisory council and then for any other matters connected therewith. And under section 44, it incorporates safety standards into regulations. Now regulations are very important. What I'm saying supervisors, a safe working environment can become a reality. All that it requires is for the employer to make sure it implements all the provisions of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And lastly, to make sure that whatever it requires whatever tools, equipment, services it needs for the successful implementation of safety, those services, tools, equipment needs to be aligned with a standard. Then it can become a reality. And then naturally, logic would dictate that we need to put controls in place. And the law says to the organization, this is the preferred legal hierarchy of controls. And the first one would be elimination, because that would be the ultimate price. If we can eliminate the risk, if we can remove the source of danger, everybody would be happy. But if that is not reasonably practicable, the next one would be an engineering control. And then followed by an administrative control. And then as a last resort, your employer must provide you with personal protective equipment. Whatever happens, when you are going to go for onto the scene to investigate the incident, that would be your very first question that you must ask. What controls was in place for the task? And more importantly, where is the evidence that would support that the worker was knowledgeable in those controls? And that brings us, supervisors, that brings us to the three levels of competence. There is what we refer to as foundational competence, toddler, left, right, left again. And then there's practical competence, 
where you are being observed, performing a task in a controlled environment. My advice to you is that when you are going to train your employees, don't train them at 40 and expect them to deliver at 120. Don't train them at foundational level. Train them so that they've got deeper insight. And with that comes a more uh, responsible, appropriate uh, response. Supervisors, this is now specifically for you. That if your company's expectations are met without incident, those deviations are typically disregarded and may even be rewarded and condoned as process improvements. And that is critical that you need to understand that. Because now we've met our targets, we've delivered on time, and nothing happened. So now we incentivize. However, if the outcome was an accident, that same deviations will be seen as violations. And so we are going to interrogate the following sections of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. We're going to first look at the health and safety policy of the organization under section 7, subsection 3 that specifically says that the policy document must be displayed. We're going to look at section 8, the general duty of the employer to its employees. And then we're going to look at section 10 that speaks about the general duties of manufacturers and others with regards to articles or substances for use at work. We're going to look at section 13 that speaks about the duty to inform. Obviously, section 14, because we are all employees and we have also got a legal duty. Section 15, the duty not to interfere with, misuse or damage things. And then we're going to look to the, the CEO, Chief Executive Officer under section 16.1, charged with certain duties. And then we're also going to look at the, the person responsible for the implementation of the safety management system, which is the 16.2, what his roles and responsibilities are. We're going to touch briefly on, on section 17, the health and safety representative, the establishment of the health and safety committee, and then last, we're going to look at section 38, that speaks about offenses, penalties, and special orders of the court. So then, section 7 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act speaks to the policy that the organization have got to display where the workers normally report for duty. And that's a, a policy commitment from the management um, to say that this is what we intend to do to make sure that the organization is compliant with the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the regulations underpinning that act. And the general duties of employer to its employees are clearly articulated under Section 8 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And there it says under Subsection 1 that every employer shall, as far as is reasonably practicable, provide and maintain a working environment that is safe. And how does he do that? Under subsection 2, it speaks to the provisions and maintenance of systems of work, plant and machinery that as far as is reasonably practicable is safe. And it's further outlined under subsection 2b where the law says to the employer, Mr. Employer, you must go out and you must identify where your potential source of dangers are coming from. Once you've done that, you need to start now a mitigation process to reduce the exposure levels to your employees and then as a last resort, provide personal protective equipment. And now section 23 comes in because remembering it is also common law that those that generate the risks are legally, morally, financially responsible for controlling that risk. Section 10, subsection 3 says, 
that any person who designs, manufactures, import, sells or supplies any substance for use at work shall ensure as far as is reasonably practicable that the substance is safe and without the risk to health and properly used. And then it says B, take steps to ensure that the information is available, ladies and gentlemen, about what? The risk to health and safety associated with that substance. The conditions necessary to ensure that the substance will be safe and without risk to health and properly used. And lastly, the procedures to be followed in the event of that substance. In fact, if you have got substances for use at work, there's also a regulation that you must comply with. And that is the hazardous uh, chemical regulation. And supervisors take note of this regulation. Because that regulation clearly first spells out or defines what a, a hazardous substance is in terms of it's either a corrosive, an asphyxiant, an irritant, and it then says to the employer that before the worker is or may be exposed, the employer shall, in consultation with the Health and Safety Committee for that workplace, ensure that the workers are adequately and comprehensively trained at intervals as prescribed by the committee on the scope of the regulation. B, the potential source of exposure. C, the potential risk to health caused by the exposure. And D, potential detrimental effect of exposure on his or her reproductive ability. Have you ever thought about when you drive and you see a vehicle like this? It's got a placard at the back. What do you think is the reason for that placarding? Remember what K says under the hazardous chemical regulation? the procedures to be followed in the event of an accident involving that substance. Exactly what's under the Act, under Section 10, Subsection 3, the procedures to be followed in the event of an incident involving that substance. So this placard is primarily there for the emergency services to be used in the event of an incident involving this substance. And you'll find that this placard, it's got, remembering that there are over two and a half thousand different substances. Each one has got its own unique identification number, what we refer to as the UN number. In this case, it is 1023, and 1023 we call petrol in South Africa. In the States, they, ref they will have the same truck, also 1023, but it will be referred to as gasoline. The point I'm trying to make here is that it doesn't matter where you go. It's United, it's a United Nations number, which means globally recognizable. Then you get the operator telephone number, the 24-hour advice telephone number, which means that is the, the entity or the company that manages the fleet of that. And then in, your, in the law zone, you get the specialist advice telephone number, which means that is the person that is knowledgeable about that specific substance. And then it gives you the hazard, this big diamond speaks to the hazard class. In this case, petrol is three, so there is a hazard class, and then that is flammable liquids. And then it gives you a little flame there. And remembering supervisors, I'm, 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 I'm giving this to you as well, because remembering trucks will offload these substances that you require for use at work. So you would also need to understand what is required when these vehicles pull up here. You need to understand, you need to be able to interpret the information, not only from the placarding, but also from the transport emergency card that the worker or that the driver needs to have. And also the uh, goods declaration as well. And which brings me now to back to section 8, subsection 2E. And where the law says to the employer, now Mr. Employer, providing such information, instruction, 
training and supervision as may be necessary in the interest of health and safety. Supervisors do not abdicate that responsibility of training those staff that reports to you to somebody else. When the worker joins, you define the standard. You provide the worker with the right values. First time, then you are happy. Then you can go ahead. Then you can hand over ownership of the task to the worker. Because now the worker has been adequately trained, not only on what needs to happen and how it needs to happen, but in the context of that the worker understand that there are implications for the task. You, are, you need to now advise supervisors, the employee, that failure to perform against agreed upon set standards could be subject to internal corrective actions being taken against that specific employee. Remembering supervisors, this behavior cannot continue indefinitely. So the worker needs to understand that there are implications for a continuation of this behavior. We need to manage effectively. So your primary function, the primary reason supervisor why, you're, while, why you are here is to make sure that what your employer has already developed are being given effect to. You must make sure that the precautionary measures taken by the employer are implemented. And so what that requires of you is what I would refer to somehow or the other as a PTO or a plan task observation. Supervisors, you must make sure that those people that report to you have got a job description, what they are responsible for. And I want you to do yourself a favor, supervisors. I want you to personally, all those people, all those staff members that reports to you, I want you to personally induct them. Because things do go wrong because of what workers do and also what workers don't do. And that's why section 14b says, to the employee, as regards any duty, or requirement imposed on your employer or any other person by this act cooperate with such employer or person to enable that duty to be performed or complied with. Based on section 14c that the law says carry out any lawful order which means a lawful order is therefore allowed. Just think about it for a minute. Because it makes sense to me. So therefore naturally an unlawful order is not allowed. Supervisors lawful will be when you as the supervisor gives out an instruction to that employee that guarantees his health and safety. Unlawful is when you are giving an instruction to that employee and to the employee's mind, his health and safety could be compromised. And there's a word that comes to mind now called congruency. Congruency. Safety and your operations needs to be all in one. And so section 14D now says to the employee that if any situation which is unsafe or unhealthy comes to your attention, you as the employee shall report that unsafe condition to the safety representative or to your supervisor. And from there, we need to then have it resolved via the health safety committee, which you will be part of in any case. So just understand from that perspective. And the worker also needs to understand that. Because management cannot fix what he is unaware of. And last but not least, if the employee is involved in any incident, he shall, before the shift is done, report that to the employer. Or if not, at 
reasonably practical to report before the shift is done at least the first thing in the morning. You, you would know supervisors that each and every company should have a, a code of conduct under Schedule 8 of the LRA that would specify or it would articulate or it would state all the applicable offenses and it will then also give you the the applicable uh, the applicable sanctions versus that. A remembering procedural aspect is that when you have when you are making an allegation that the worker failed to do that or the other, there's procedures. You've got to give sufficient notification. You've got to afford the employee specific rights. So from that perspective, there is an obligation on the part of the person that initiates the inquiry. And so then during the inquiry itself, uh, there's also procedures before a judgment can be made against whether the, the employee or is guilty or not guilty. Please also be mindful to inform that specific employee with regards to section 15 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which to my mind at least should be incorporated into your disciplinary code. Because this section speaks to the duty not to interfere with, damage or misuse things. Every employer who has got 20 or more employees at a specific workplace shall within four months of the commencement of this act or after commencement of business, or as soon as the number of employees exceeds 20, as the case may be, designate a point for a specific period of time, a safety representative for that section of the workplace. And you have got to afford that specific representative the, 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 the rights, and you've got to afford or make space for that specific uh, safety representative to perform his functions as outlined under section 18 1 and outlined under section 18 2. My appeal to you now is to interrogate each and every section of section 38 subsection 1 up until P that says willfully or recklessly does anything at a workplace or in connection with the use of plant or machinery which threatens the life of any person at work shall be guilty of an offence and on conviction be liable to a fine not exceeding 50,000 Rand or imprisonment not exceeding one year or not exceeding both such fine and or imprisonment. Supervisors, it's our organization, isn't it? We've got a role to play. We have got a role to play in making sure that our company is being protected from any litigation. That we, we, our brand, we need to enhance our brand. We, our brand cannot be tainted by any acts or omissions on our part. And this is the communication that must be have or had with your employees constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. Section 189, it become a reality now because you need to lay people off. Why? Non-compliance. Why? No political will. Why? Issues that have been raised have not been attended to or resolved. And this is where you come in as a supervisor. And that is the reason why under your functions or your duties rather under section 8 to section 8 to I ensuring that work is performed, plant and machinery being used, under the general supervision of a person trained to understand the hazards associated with it and who's got the authority to ensure that the precautionary measures taken by the employer are implemented. You are required to give the instruction, 
you are required to supervise, you are required to enforce. But they must also raise their hand if anything is unclear for them. So when something does go wrong, the first question that will be asked is, who will be held liable? So when we talk about liability, we're talking about who will be held accountable by law. You remember what I was saying earlier on, the cascading effect? Internally, in your own organization, it will first go to the 16.1, then it will cascade down to the 16.2, one step down to the section 8, and then to you, yes, 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 to you as the supervisor. It's going to be a heavy price to pay. If you cannot prove that you've taken reasonable steps, if you cannot show evidence, show evidence, supervisors, you must show evidence. And my suggestion to you, therefore, is that all communications with your staff, with your subordinates, put that somehow or the other in writing. Make sure that workers sign off on training. Make sure that workers acknowledge their, their duties. Make sure that workers commit or give or, or commit to perform the task to the best of their ability. So anything and everything that transpires or that happens between yourself and your employee or your subordinate, make sure that you've got some documentary evidence. All I'm saying to you supervisors, get outside of your comfort zone. Do the right thing. Ensure that the workers are aligned with the vision and the mission of your organization. And so don't let any person challenge that. Don't allow any person to prevent you from reaching that. And when I speak to the ordinary worker, I keep on saying to them, listen, you don't, don't worry about your manager. For you are a normal general worker. Forget about your manager. Forget about the owner. Just greet them. They are none of your concern. The only person that you listen to is your supervisor because that's the person that you report to. Go out there. Protect your organization from any potential civil or criminal litigation that may flow from the management of safety within your work environment. God bless you. Go well.